Many people do think that uh, we're going back to the 1930s and then to the 1940s, and you can understand why. Well, first of all, in the 1920s, you had a series of financial crises. Those financial crises led to deep recessions. Those recessions then led to the collapse of democracies, particularly in interwar Europe, and then there was the turn to authoritarianism, if not fascism. Are we going down the same road? Well, actually, I think not. And prizes for anybody who's actually ever figured out that's Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher. And it's another conditionality problem. You don't get to replicate the past. The very fact that you've lived the past means that that past simply can't come up. That's Kierkegaard's point. But he basically says that the world is always a world of becoming and that you live it forward into an unknown. So if the world is essentially unknown, and you've already, you've already exhausted the conditions of the past, you can't really go back. It doesn't work like that. It's a convenient way of thinking, right? We fall into that as humans. We like to see patterns when there are none. But the world's actually much more random. Now, if that's the case, is it all random? No. Let's think about regimes. You begin to see that there are these patterns, these clusters of how people do things, and they hang together in certain ways. Now, think of that as the hardware. Now think about the software that goes with it. So if economies are different complexes of institutions, how you do skills, how you do retirement, how you do governance, how you do infrastructure, all these things, the rules as to how you do that, what's it all for? The software, that can be programmed in different ways. So what produced our current macroeconomic regime, by which I mean the sort of the, the modal type of the Western world, the developed world just now? To do that, you have to go back to 1943. So at the height of the war, Keynes is running the show in the British Treasury, and there's a great line that you've all heard a bit of, and here's the full line. The long run is a misleading guide to current affairs. In the long run, we are all dead. That's the bit you've heard. Economists set themselves too easy, too useless a task, if in tempestuous seasons they can only tell us when the storm is long past that the ocean will be flat. Now, why was Keynes concerned about the, the short term? He's concerned about the short term because the way that he thought about the economics, it's not about the government spending money, that's what it's become down the line. It was about investors' expectations. So if your investment expectations in the short run is that I shouldn't invest because we're in the middle of a recession, you will not invest. And when you watch her, you will not invest. And when you watch them, you will not invest. So everyone's short-term expectation compounds and becomes the long term. So you have to change the expectation baseline. That's why you boost consumption. That's why you do all those things. Now, in the right-hand panel there, there was a piece written in 1943 by an emigre economist from Poland called Mikhail Kolecki, or Kolecki, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And it's called Political Aspects of Full Employment. And what Keynes said the central problem of the Great Depression was, was millions of unemployed with no safety net. And the result of that was desperation, poverty, and more importantly, authoritarianism, fascism, communism, things that will destroy capitalism. So the whole goal of full employment was a political goal. What Kalecki pointed out was if you run full employment as a regime for 30 years, there's going to be a problem. So what would the problem be? Have a look at the top panel, 1979, Britain, the winter of discontent the unions bringing the country to a standstill. The bottom panel is Gough Whitlam in 1973, the same problem of stagflation. You see, if you run full employment for a very long time, ultimately you end up with very tight labor markets. And if you have national, relatively closed economies where capital can't get out and move around, the only thing that can happen for, for business to retain profits is to push up prices. But that's a nominal trick. And after you push it up a few times, wages are bound to catch up, and suddenly you get caught in an inflationary spiral. Business has to find a way out, because otherwise there's inflation, a collapse in investment, and a collapse in profitability. Kolecki predicted this by page three of that 1943 piece. Page four gets even better. He says, what's business going to do in such a world? He said it would fund a market-friendly political revolution. They would discipline organized labor by weakening the power of trade unions. They would deregulate finance to increase capital mobility so that if labor went on strike, it wouldn't matter. And if you have a look at the incidence of strikes across the developed world since 1979, it goes from high to not very high to basically non-existent. 
You will also hand over policy to technocrats. You don't want parliaments running those things. That's where labor has a voice. And you will above all globalize production because that way capital has the whip hand.